The title that Gary sought uh, is actually Uncertainty, Creativity, and the Concept of Limits. Uh, though he and I did not uh, discuss uh, uh, this uh, at all, one of the features of the World Academy is that uh, there is a, quite a number of us that think alike. So we don't even have to uh, you know, keep uh, asking one another the likelihood that we overlap uh, uh, in our thoughts and tendencies and what we would like to do seems to be fairly high, I would say, of the order of 70%, uh, and those differences are very worthwhile. Let me start with the last thing, the question of limits, and for those of you who may not know, it was at the conference in Heidelberg that uh, uh, we really had uh, a major talk. I was actually supposed to give that talk, except that I turned out to have a very bad uh, urinary infection and could not come to to Heidelberg at that time. Heidelberg. I mean, uh, not Heidelberg, Hyderabad. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, the conference was organized. Several other people, Gary, spoke on this limits to rationality. And uh, we had even a project that we wanted to start on the question of limits to rationality. Now here, of course, the question of limits is even broader. I mean, it implies all possible limits. Now, of course, as we have heard yesterday, uh, the most famous are the limits to growth. And we have discussed that, and that will be discussed, so I won't go into that anymore. Uh, the first word here is uncertainty, and that is very challenging, and I will say a few words about that. And the one that I really don't know what to do very much, uh, uh, is this subject of creativity, because this is quite an intriguing uh, uh, subject. Somehow, oddly, all of these things uh, really are related to a subject that uh, Roberto Poli was speaking yesterday, and since uh, half of the audience was not present at his talk, uh, let me just uh, emphasize what is the essence that Poli was saying. Paul was concerned with anticipation. Now, anticipation is another very important point, and let me say that following the famous limits to growth, uh, and several of us felt uneasy because uh, it meant somehow that there is a limitation and so on, uh, essentially prompted by Aurelio Pece came another report to the Club of Rome, and, the, and that report, strangely, has a total negation of that and said there are no limits to learning. And uh, over there, in that book written by uh, the following people, one was uh, 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 Maritza, the other was Botkin, the third was Andra, so a combination of an American, Romanian, you presumably know, Mircea Maritza, and uh, the third was, uh, I think it's Moroccan, uh, came this book where, of course, the emphasis was, is on learning, and let me say that here, of course, in the World Academy, we are now very much concerned with the learning, specifically higher education. Uh, but there, in this book, there is a special emphasis on anticipation, and it is precisely on anticipation that Roberto Poli was talking. And uh, the important question is, and let me say what he said and what I said in the discussion, time is one of the most intriguing subjects that exist in philosophy. We don't understand it. About 20 or 30 years ago, I don't know exactly, uh, UNESCO essentially, when UNESCO was really a good organization with a lot of money and a lot of international support, uh, actually asked for and published three big volumes, time from the point of view of sciences, time from the point of view of philosophy, and time from the point of view of culture. And uh, as I keep saying, this is extremely important. Uh, we usually like to think about the time as something which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and is linear, and when I say linear, I want also to stress that it is one-dimensional. So you don't think that there is a blob at one particular moment. That present is, which has just ended now, okay? And nothing more to that. But this is not so. The first thing that this is not so 
is that there is really a blob, and that blob can be actually quite large. There is an uncertainty hidden in the question of time. As a matter of fact, one of the most uh, important and frequently cited uncertainty principles, uncertainty relations of Heisenberg, connects the uncertainty in time with the uncertainty in energy. In other words, for a certain small amount of time, you can violate any conservation of energy. Okay? Now you can say, fine, that, that's stupid. I mean, we know the conservation of energy is one of the most important nature. Yes, this is one of the most important laws in, uh, in nature. But uh, this is uh, really true. You can, and not only that is true, indeed, this is done all the time. What would it mean in the macroscopic world? The macroscopic world would mean that uh, I could close the door and then go through the wall back and forth. That's essentially what the uncertainty principle of uh, connecting time and energy means. Okay? Now you say, this is stupid, see? I mean, how you do it? But this is exactly what is being done among all of the molecules, all of the atoms, and so on. And, of course, also not on this micro-micro scale, but also on a macro scale, when Stephen Hawking is explaining the black holes and the white holes. The story of the white holes is that white holes, of course, can, within a certain short interval of time, always generate a particle and an antiparticle. Emitting two of them, particle and antiparticle, is perfectly okay with all laws of conservation, except the law of conservation of energy. But they can break the conservation of energy for the short interval of time. But now the curious phenomenon happens. One of the partners can be absorbed, eliminated somehow, and the other partner remains alone. So there is, of course, uh, an emission of the particle, and this is, of course, what the white hole basically is. Now, so, these are just few words about the linking of the concept of the uncertainty and the concept of, uh, of time. Uh, as we said, as I said in the first talk that I had on Monday, everything which is reasonably simple in physics becomes extremely complicated in social sciences and in society in general. And Nicholas Taleb has introduced, uh, instead of using concept of certain, uncertain, uncertainty, he has introduced the concept of uh, 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 black swans uh, and uh, sometimes goes under the wild cards and so on and so on. So now, there is a big difference between the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the black swans. Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a simple formula that any one of you can use. Have make, you can make predictions there, based on that. You end up with numbers, very accurate numbers, in spite of the uncertainty. In the case of black swans, you don't know where you are. You just uh, essentially, sometimes even a posteriori, see, see some of them. So, anyway, this is it. And then, of course, there is this uh, most difficult uh, subject of all, the question of creativity, which is also intimately linked with the question of time. Okay. Now, uh, the conference that we were planning and had in Hyderabad actually was preceded by a full issue of the new scientist uh, back in 208, where uh, the discussion of rationality was uh, discussed. And here is a quotation from one physicist, Lee Smolin, who also is very well known in the following way. He's a well-known physicist in the so-called standard uh, uh, fashion of being a physicist. But then he questioned, actually, the present uh, paradigm that physics is undertaking. And the present paradigm of physics is actually the following. Uh, physics is a deductionist, say, right? So we have experiments, and then, based on these experiments, we say, we formulate certain principles, for instance, just to tell you one of the principles uh, that was crucial in the Einstein theory of relativity is the principle that uh, there is no faster movement than the speed of light. The speed of light is absolutely the fastest possible, okay? 
And based on that, then Einstein got his special theory of relativity, okay? The other question was, uh, again, in Einstein's work, uh, how to put together two processes which on the first sight have no connection, and this is the force of gravity and uh, the accelerated motion. And Einstein said that this is just the same thing. If you happen to be in an elevator on the Earth, and then you simply have, uh, we started, we didn't know when you will come. Uh, and when you are in the elevator and uh, you are on the Earth, there is a gravitational, of course, uh, force uh, here. And if the elevators break down, you fall, and of course, all the objects and you are falling. The same effect would be if you are not on the Earth, but in the interstellar space, and the spaceship where you are in happens to move in an accelerated way. And if that acceleration happens to be the same as the acceleration that we currently have due to the gravity, it would be the same thing. So he combined these two things. And so based on such very clean and clear formulation, then he developed first the special and then the general theory of, uh, of relativity. And this is part of what we call rational approaches and so on. And finally, this theory of relativity plus quantum physics leads us, has led us to the question of what is the present reality of the world. And according to a theory, which goes under the name of the string theory, and then it gets uh, brains, and the word brain is just a cut of the proper English word membrane, so you just take the brain and then forget that. Uh, as the word bracket was broken into bra and cat and so on, so this is like to do these things, you know, uh, to sort of confuse. So anyway, uh, according to the string theories, which, by the way, is very, very mathematical, is on the border of being able to be tested, and that is very, very tricky, uh, tricky things, the concept is that the space is ten-dimensional, and there is an additional dimension of time. It is strange, but when you look into that, you can find out that there is no room for additional dimension of time, because that would be seriously violating the causality. Now, there, of course, be very careful to distinguish causality and determinism. These are two, two things, and one has to really be, be careful about that. So anyway, uh, Lee Smolin uh, wrote uh, a book which Gary and I, for a while, were actually quite uh, intrigued uh, about that. We tried, uh, to, get him to, we, we, we we tried to get him to the meeting and so on. Uh, luckily, of course, we have several outstanding physicists among the Academy. One is uh, Roberto Pecei, who led for uh, a while uh, a group uh, of uh, uh, particle physicists in the United States. The other is Harvey Schopper who was for two terms Director General of CERN. So there are a number of very distinguished physicists that we could have that. But the basic thing is that this somehow falls too much into philosophy and not in very much of the concrete thinking, and then it becomes actually very, very uh, tricky. But, okay, there is no doubt that uh, the field of rationality, the field of exact thinking, the field of science uh, is something that uh, really is, uh, as Molin, Smolin wrote here, is the reason of our prosperity, emancipation of slaves, of women, uh, uh, all of this has these essentially very important roots which are uh, science-based. Uh, and therefore it's not actually strange uh, that public, you know, there have been many, many uh, longitudinal studies, what public does say about people in various professions and throughout the world now, as far as I know, these measurements started immediately after the Second World War, so it's of the order of 50 years, very high are both scientists and MDs, physicians. Politicians are almost at the bottom line. 
uh, and uh, with, uh, as you see here, 61 percent consider politicians to be dishonest, and even a larger percentage considering them to be incompetent, and that is, of course, what is, uh, what is uh, a problem. Uh, here is another quotation from this same special uh, issue of the New Scientist, and said that actually now what we are, and there is a book written by Al Gore, Attack on Reason, where, of course, he quite correctly argued that uh, first, uh, science, scientific methods have been on one side, hijacked for the purposes totally wrong. For instance, you can, uh, I mean, when there was a recent uh, football championship, then most of the coaches were saying, I'm using the scientific method for my team to play against Brazil or against Argentina or against Germany or something like that, you know. Equally, of course, science is being hijacked by uh, politicians, by policy makers, by people in the business and so on. And so all of this is making some rather, uh, rather uh, strange, uh, strange things. Of course, what one likes to say is that uh, knowledge is one of the features, one of the characteristics, no, that one of the characteristics of knowledge is that it is inexhaustible. If anyone knows something and shares with us, uh, that person did not lose the information. It loses the privilege of being the only one, but usually this is much more than overcompensated by other comments by other people and so on. So knowledge is really truly an inexhaustible uh, uh, resource. Now, the important question is uh, that since this knowledge is based on rationality, rationality is the uniquely human quality, is uh, where our rationality comes from, is it entirely from evolution, and then the part of that question is how reliable is our rationality. And there is a famous saying of Niels Bohr when he was arguing with a friend, and Niels Bohr said to him, you do not think, you are just being logical. And uh, so one has to be very careful that there is a very big difference between the thinking and the logic. Okay, one very simple thing is, is the following, namely, thinking implies essentially creativity, totally new thinking. Logic implies that you go from certain principle and then uh, follow this up. And actually the clearest example is, again, in a science which for many cases, uh, first, it is not necessarily a science, and second is uh, uh, really the oldest one, and this is geometry. Geometry has been uh, formulated on an entirely axiomatic basis, starting from Euclid, and so it is more than 2,000 years now. Okay, what does this mean? It means that you have certain postulates, as they are called, axioms, and then based on that, everything else follows, okay? And then all of these axioms sound very simple, intuitive, except one which was really complicated. Uh, and since you all have more than the first grade of uh, elementary school, let me quote this famous fifth postulate, just to remind you, and uh, I want you to appreciate that indeed it is complicated because uh, rather than all of the others, which essentially can be put in a very simple sentence, this one requires many more words. And it says, if you have a straight line, and, that, and, and then you have a point outside of that straight line, then you can draw only one line through that point, which would be parallel to that original line. So this is the idea of the parallel lines, fine. So you have a point over, you have a straight line, which is this, and then you have a point, and you can have only this, which is parallel to this. This already would not be parallel, it would intersect. So it is obviously intuitive, it's meaningful, and so for about a thousand years, mathematicians tried to reduce this to other, and they did not succeed. So then, it was two, uh, three essentially mathematicians that decided to say, okay, we give this up. 
And uh, one of them was a famous mathematician, Gauss. The other was a Russian mathematician, Lobachevsky. The third was a Hungarian, Bolyai. And so they said, okay, now suppose you have uh, one line and you have a point outside. And suppose that you can draw infinitely many lines that are parallel. Or suppose you cannot draw a single line which is parallel. Now you would say this is stupid. No, it is not really stupid. I mean, first of course, geometry allows you to paint your, uh, I mean, any, any axiomatic thinking allows you to make any postulate you want. Uh, but to make this a little bit uh, more familiar to you, let me just say that the realization of the, of the fact that you have one line, one straight line, and you have one point outside of that straight line, and that you cannot draw any parallel line, is something that you see all the time on the surface of the sphere. Uh, an equivalent of the line, a line on the surface of the sphere, is essentially a meridian. Right? Now, if you take any point outside of the meridian, you have a meridian going through Greenwich, okay, our famous meridian, right? Then you take another meridian which goes through Dubrovnik, and if you want to make uh, a straight line, then they intersect at the pole. So you can't do that. So here you see very clearly an example that you can develop an entirely new geometry. This is the geometry on the surface of the, of the sphere, and this would be a so-called Riemann geometry. And therefore, this immediately is going outside of your logical frame and allows you a new thinking. And this is all what is actually there. On the other hand, of course, let me say that at the beginning of the 20th century, there have been a number of paradoxes. Peano and all of these people have devised paradoxes. Russell, the famous man whom we are very... Uh, familiar with uh, Hilbert and so on, they were all dealing with the issue of paradoxes, and paradoxes are extremely important. Then, of course, there is another question, and that is uh, that logic can actually be so-called fuzzy logic. The logic that we have is essentially equivalent to plus, minus, and zero, right? But you could develop very easily mathematics that uh, in instead of having just plus and minus and zero, could have many signs. That's perfectly okay. So in the case of the fuzzy logic, you could actually say this is not true, this is not false, this is 20% true, 50% uh, wrong, uh, and 30% uh, totally uncertain or something like that. So you would actually certain to certain extent, uh, and uh, to some extent, and you will do this from the certainty, uncertainty, lattice, and that would be one of the, of, the, of the possibilities. Now, all of this, of course, is related to our brain, and I'm sorry that Alberto is not here because uh, he is a psychologist, and indeed our brain, in spite of several years and decades that the UN and various governments devoted to the study of the brain, Brain remains something that we really do not quite uh, understand. And, of course, as Chris Friss uh, writes in that uh, issue, conscious reasoning is an attempt to justify a decision after it has been made. Yesterday we had a very important discussion on decision-making. It was very important. Now, how do we make decisions? It's all but uh, logical. And in that way, if you would compare a computer and the human mind, uh, it is, again, a complicated thing. So, is our brain a result of evolution entirely? Are there some sudden leaps uh, or, or something like that? How is that influenced by our senses and by the extension of our senses? We kept saying, of course, that when we see now the heaven, that things which was uh, so impressive to Kant, when we see it in Kant's way, namely, as anyone would see, just with our naked eyes, that's completely different than what we see when we look at the microwave radiation, infrared, uh, X-ray pictures, and so on, and so on. So all of this is uh, 
is, is really very, very question, questionable. And then, of course, uh, uh, there is a very important concept of something and nothing. And uh, for a long while in the Greek philosophy, it was very clear what nothing is. And then quantum physics came, and actually vacuum is by no means vacuum. Vacuum is bubbling with uh, various things, and, and there is a number of stories there. And then there is another question, and this is relationship within scientific disciplines. Why mathematics is so powerful, and is it so powerful everywhere? Uh, it turns out that we know it's powerful in natural or in physical sciences. But uh, maybe it's not uh, even that uh, in, uh, in uh, life sciences, and there are great doubts about its usefulness in, uh, in social sciences, in economy, and so on. Uh, just to remind you, about uh, 50 years ago, a well-known French uh, mathematician, René Tom, developed something which was supposed to be moving mathematics in a different way from the mathematics of Leibniz and Newton. The mathematics of Leibniz and Newton, of course, is the current mathematical pinnacle in many ways with the so-called integral and differential calculus. Okay, and this is in many ways ideals for making prediction in physical sciences. But what René Tom did, uh, he developed something which was called theory of catastrophe and took care into concepts like bifurcation, sudden jumps, and so on. One of the members of the Club of Rome, that later on uh, somehow dropped out of the picture, a Hungarian philosopher, Erwin Laszlo, was working in that direction, but more from the philosophical side than from the, uh, then from the uh, mathematical side. Now, of course, the question is, can reason give answers to everything? And if it cannot, uh, what are the limits of uh, rationality? Now, science, of course, has no final truth. And, of course, uh, <coughs> there are concepts like beauty, which, in principle, do have final truths. Uh, this story, you know, of, of course, uh, 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 which links us again to the question of time, uh, has been addressed by uh, two persons. Uh, uh, one was Dostoevsky in his uh, famous book, Brother Karamazovi, where he says, if everything on earth, on earth were rational, nothing would happen. And uh, was about a century earlier was written by gentleman that comes from this city, Borkovich, who was a physicist and mathematician, and he said, if everything would be fully determined, there would be no need for time. Uh, and this is indeed is so, because you can define the classical mechanics in terms of the Hamiltonian that does not have time as a variable. Uh, one of the beautiful and unpleasant thing is uh, uh, and of course has been tested, that based on Newton's equation, you could predict where specific planets would be at the specific time. And this is how, uh, let's see, it was uh, uh, Uranus that was discovered. Right? I mean, so you exactly know where it is. You put uh, the telescope there and you find it. You know? And, of course, you don't need time, because uh, time is there, uh, very, very uh, unnecessary quantity. And, of course, in this case, it is very important to say that uh, art provides much more freedom than, uh, than, than science is. Uh, so, as I said, time is one of the most difficult concepts, and let's remember that the Greeks really had two gods for time. One was Cronus, and Cronus is more or less what we have in terms of our watch. And the other is Kairos, and Kairos is a god connected with uh, what we may call loss opportunities. 
And these, of course, are very, very important when we look for specifically now uh, the situation, for instance, what we lost as an opportunity offered by uh, the end of the Cold War and the beginning of this enormous good era which happened in 1990, really Kairos was against us. So, and of course Berson wrote that time is creation or, or nothing else. So there is a number of things there which are uh, extremely connected with the question of uh, also creativity where, as I said already in the first lecture, but let me repeat, Gader theorem, which is the theorem in mathematics, dealing with a narrow branch of mathematics, the so-called uh, number theory, shows that there are truths which cannot be proven. And the proof, on the other hand, is really when you prove something, that almost is dead. I mean, that, this is finished. There is nothing else, you know. So when somebody tells you, yes, the uh, sum of all of the angles uh, in a triangle is 180 degrees, what is that? I mean, it's fine. Done. Uh, then there is a question uh, raised by the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, defining what does it mean that reasonable where he actually says that reasonable, he gives it an entire social dimension, means thinking in tune, being actually uh, somehow compatible with the rest of the people in, uh, in the place where you, where you live. Uh, totally opposite, though using almost the same, uh, the same idea, is the title of the book uh, by uh, a biologist Wilson, called consilience. It's rather a strange, uh, I usually don't encounter the English word consilience, uh, but has this feeling of jumping together. So it's not being in tune, but all of us jump together and not necessarily in the same direction. We might be producing at the same time the theory of relativity and quantum physics as it was done exactly more or less at the same time, and of course almost at the same time finding the basis and the evidence uh, for, uh, uh, for the genetic structure and so on, and the DNA. So, yes, these are, these are a, number of, uh, a, a number of things. And then, of course, there is this very important uh, uh, relationship between the reason, rationality, and religion. Uh, there is a project called XREL dealing with explaining religiosity, and a physicist, a physicist uh, somehow, sooner or later, always come to the question of uh, religion and God. And uh, uh, all of them, of course, uh, you can say that are religious, but all of them make their God somewhat different than God is. There is a famous Einstein statement where he said, uh, you know, my theory is very beautiful. That's, uh, let me emphasize that this aspect of beauty. Physicists are hooked on the theory of being beautiful. And uh, at one occasion, actually at the occasion of the conference devoted by Einstein, the famous uh, physicist Dirac was asked by newspaper people, you know, newspaper people always like to ask you provocative questions, and the question was, uh, Professor Dirac, uh, what would you prefer? your theory to be in agreement with the facts or to be beautiful, and he immediately replied to be beautiful. Uh, who cares for the data? You know, this statement, who cares for the data, is a Hegelian one, you know. Hegel used to say that if the data don't agree with our idea, too bad for the data, you know. This is typically what all politicians say, you know, don't confuse me with your data, you know, I don't want to know that, things like that. So that these are all interesting, uh, interesting things. But anyway, I mean, uh, Einstein's statement was, uh, my theory is so beautiful, and if God would not make the world according to my theory, I'm sorry for the God. I don't know. So these are, the, these are these things. And then, as I said, he was the guy who made twice twice the same mistake in, in, in a row. Now, Barbour, who is another physicist, contemporary British physicist, I think he's from Britain or Scotland, I don't know, uh, he actually distinguishes four ways for the relationship between religion and science. They can be in conflict, they frequently are in conflict, they can be in dialogue, they can be independent, and they can integrate. 
Stephen Gould, who actually is a well-known uh, evolutionist and biologist, argued for uh, this combination of independence and dialogue, and he calls it non-overlapping magisteria, NOMA. John Paul II favored integration, and in his uh, speech that he gave at the Eriche Institute, Eriche, Eriche is the old Phoenician uh, temple on uh, the tip of uh, Sicily, that physicists have their conferences there. And uh, so John Paul II visited and gave the speech there, and this is even inscribed there, and he said the science and religions are two wings of the human spirit, independent and but integrated is the, is the human spirit and uh, is really, according to him, uh, something which is a gift of God. Now, the question of thinking, and let me now jump to the military domain, since we are now close to military situations anyway. Uh, modern military likes to emphasize the need for uh, thinking the unthinkable. So you really don't think only standard things, you think the unthinkable, and this is, this is very, very important. And, uh, of course, uh, this can be very much abused. There could be very uh, bad, uh, bad, uh, bad uh, stories. The first one, of course, uh, is in question with rationality. Rationality science, on one side, is an enormous uh, power, and we might be victims uh, of uh, what uh, uh, Dostoevsky writes uh, in uh, both Crime and Punishment, uh, where reason can really affect uh, human behavior. And then again in the Brothers Karamazov, the great inquisitor who said that actually the three dangerous forces capable of enslaving us are miracle, mystery, and authority. And unfortunately science has components of all three of them, right? We are really authority. Uh, really there is a mystery and uh, from the atomic bomb on, a miracle is, uh, is, is there. So there is a number of things. Now, there is another thing that uh, Gary and I were invited by our friend, also a fellow of the World Academy, Jonathan Granoff, to attend the meeting in, uh, in New York. And at that time, we, were, we had dinner with a person who was, uh, I think, uh, either in Congress or something like that, I don't recall, where he told us a story that he attended the meeting of high-ranking people who were discussing how to do something, and one of them has said this was the meeting of chief executive officers, generals, and so on. And he said, you know, I have a group of very intelligent people who do not think. He was trying actually to impress that he has a group of people, expert, who will do exactly the solution within what they want to do, okay? Now, there are thousands of examples of that. I mean, uh, uh, building of the bomb is a classical example, uh, which has a number of the things. Don't forget, the bomb was initiated by scientists, okay? Apparently, it was initiated by scientists three times independently, in the United States, in Germany, and in Japan, okay? Because, of course, politicians didn't know how, they even, even didn't know what that is, I mean, so they couldn't. So it was the scientists who did that. Then, uh, remember that these people who actually initiated this did not have a clearance to go to Los Alamos, to do anything. They were actually outside of that. Then the bomb was being made. Then at the time when uh, there were three bombs made, just three bombs, one bomb had to be used to test whether it works at all. This was tested in Alamogordo in New Mexico. So the United States had two additional bombs and maybe enough of the material to build a couple of more. Sillard, initiator of the famous Sillard uh, Einstein letter to Roosevelt, uh, writes another letter now to Truman and says, you know, I think this, uh, you have two powerful weapons, I suggest you don't drop it on the city, you drop it in a desert to show to the Japanese uh, how powerful that is. Of course, Truman rejects that, and now 
go into the shoes of Truman and think what you would do. I mean, would you, out of the two that you have, waste one more somewhere where nobody will see it? I mean, everybody saw for, uh, everybody saw Hiroshima, everybody knew for that uh, Nagasaki, that would have been dropped somewhere in the middle. So they, these are these are extremely difficult uh, uh, difficult things and not easy. And we have to think that very very often this uh, specialization, this not thinking outside of certain frames, is a very typical one. I can tell you the example, for instance, in my own Croatian academy, the way how we elect people. And this is something where uh, I can tell you some of us disagree, but still is a uh, dominant motion. We elect people based on the following, uh, in, in the following way. Uh, each academy has its sections. Right? I mean, our society has two sections. Uh, Croatian Academy has more. Uh, uh, and the idea is who will elect new fellows. And the story is that only experts should elect new fellows. So the story is that only physicists and possibly chemists decides upon physicists, uh, not others. You know, because who am I to say that one painter is a great painter? This is obviously wrong because, I mean, if a painter is a great painter, it should be recognized. I mean, I can't lead a PhD study in economy, but I can certainly realize uh, that Krug Krugman, for instance, or Stiglitz or Sen are great economists. But I mean, this is still one of the, of the very important things. Now, of course, as we said, there is always this decision inclinations to think that uh, uh, clever people should be able to do certain things. You all know that uh, Einstein was proposed to be the president of the newly found state of uh, Israel. This was uh, uh, proposed by Ben-Gurion, and here Ben-Gurion writes later on, I was all the time afraid he would accept, but of course Einstein did not accept. And maybe it would be a great president, maybe it would be a lousy president, God knows that, I mean, it's hard to say this. Uh, so there is a number of problems there, which of course we hardly have time. Uh, and I mean, it's not only a question of time, it's much more the question of my inability uh, to say that. But an important point is that it is very clear, it has been said throughout the history, and it is written also in this new scientist. Humankind cannot live by rational thoughts alone. This is absolutely essential. I mean, we do need these other dimensions of us, uh, uh, whether this is emotion or not is obviously another story. It might be useful to just to group uh, uh, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Information is enormous amount of information that we have. Uh, for instance, uh, one good example, by the way, is the work, uh, which is now very much in the media, the activity of uh, National Security Agency where they are collecting an enormous amount of, uh, of work. Uh, the meeting with uh, Gary and I were recently in uh, uh, Romania. This was, uh, what was this uh, title uh, that uh, Mircea Malica organi organized? Uh, uh, you know, he organized Mircea Malica. It was two meetings. Uh, and you had the meeting before and I had a meeting after dealing with uh, a future uh, uh, councils, uh, right? Uh, okay, is yeah, irrelevant. The Emil's meeting. No, no, not, not, not the Emil's meeting, the one after that. The Emil's meeting was on Levant. Uh, yes. Yeah, but there was another meeting uh, in uh, Bucharest uh, where Ruben was uh, and. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, right. yeah that, that, that meeting. That meeting. Civil, civil, future, civilization. Civilization and the future, yeah. Uh, okay, a famous person there was actually a man who was the first director general of this place, Johan Galtung. Johan Galtung, a famous Norwegian sociologist, was the first director of uh, IUC. And uh, we had a meeting, it was just at the time of this explosion of uh, NSA, and he said, you know, there are three approaches. One is American approach. They believe they have powerful computer and they collect all of the things. They believe they can uh, 
using the power of computer, get enough proper information. The other is the Soviet approach, now taken by the Russians, and the third is the Chinese, and Chinese approach is that they just hard, think very, very hard, make the narrative, and try to understand how these things are actually working. And he says the American system is worse because it depends on such enormous amount of data you can't handle. And I told to Johan, yeah, okay, but you see, we, we physicists uh, handle an enormous amount of data. I mean, Higgs uh, uh, is based on billions and billions of events, uh, and then we try to find out. So why don't we offer our help to NSA and we get some uh, financing for doing the Higgs in the meantime? And Gautam made a very relevant comment. He said, yes, but you have the theory. And they don't. You know, physics, uh, physics is guided by the theory. We exactly know what we are looking in the case of the Higgs. We are looking for the particle with these, these, these properties, okay? So you have a huge crowd of people, but you look for the one which is, let's say, tall and has a hat. You recognize that person quickly, right? Or reasonably quickly, right? Uh, in the case over there, you really don't know. You don't know what are your enemies, you construe your enemies, and so on. So the question of information is of utmost importance, and even the best uh, computer facilities that we have are hardly enough uh, to uh, handle this enormous amount of data. Some data have errors, some data are pseudo-data, and so this is very difficult. Then we have knowledge. And then, of course, the most important thing would be wisdom. Now, wisdom is something that uh, may or may not be related to happiness. Aristotle believes that it is related to happiness. Uh, and then the basic question is, are we wise less than evolution needs? And there is this famous song by Frank Zappa, information is not knowledge, knowledge is not wisdom, wisdom is not truth, truth is not beauty. Uh, which again could be read together with the Keats uh, poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn. On the question of beauty, of course, there is evidence that there is more beauty than evolution actually needs. And uh, so basically, uh, once again, uh, let me conclude in the same thing, science has done an enormous thing. It has generated the rapidly changing, globalized and interconnected world. And uh, there is, uh, you remember that uh, I think it was the first or the second day when Roberto Poli posed the question of power and said that power is a typical case uh, of uh, zero-sum game. Okay, the theory of games is a recent contribution uh, to, the, to the sciences. It started with von Neumann, actually at the time of building the bombs. So let us not underestimate the greatest people, von Neumann, Teller, Oppenheimer, Einstein, were in one way or another involved in building the bomb, as was Da Vinci and, or, and uh, Archimedes. Archimedes was a weapon maker, you know. I mean, uh, he died doing that, essentially. So we are not uh, innocent uh, in, uh, in, in that way. This is what uh, we, we all, all do. Now the question is, uh, uh, it would be very important to avoid one type of games, and this is lose-lose games, and it would be very important to maximize the frequency of the win-win games. There is a theory developed by a famous uh, engineer who turned into economist and sociologist, Vilifredo Pareto. He is a very interesting, unfortunately there is no Italian here who could tell us more. Uh, Pareto is uh, Italian, then who lived in Switzerland, moved back and forth, and so on, was even accused of uh, some pro-fascist uh, views and uh, similar things. And uh, Pareto formulated that uh, there is the so-called optimum when all the best things have been done, and now you can only play the famous uh, zero-sum games. Now the question is, can you uh, go and do more. This is one of the things uh, 
that uh, economists do know, I'm sure Ian knows more about that. This is related to the famous Nash, CRM Nash is the guy who is portrayed in this uh, famous movie, uh, you know, Beautiful Mind and so on. So there is a lot of, um, of, of, of things uh, there. Uh, apparently a lot of evolution goes on a basis of the win-win game which then saturates at the point uh, of, uh, of the zero-sum game, which of course is, uh, is what, uh, what Pareto is doing and saying. And uh, I'm putting these two quotations to somehow lead us to the economic uh, discussion. One is, uh, where do you do the best saving? As I said yesterday, the best, best place to store food is in another person's belly, which is a basis of uh, the fact that besides competition, we have cooperation, which is very important, is evolutionary important. And then the strange words of uh, St. Bernard uh, of Clairvaux, who said, uh, what is ours? And he said, ours is what we give to others, <laughs> because that is for always yours. I mean, uh, otherwise, whatever you have can be taken away from you. But, uh, you know, whatever teacher gave to his or her students, this is, this is always his, and is always he in the mind of all of his, his students. So let me just remind you that most Nobel acceptance speeches start with uh, a person thanking his professors. Some of them do what is also very important, thanking their students, because it is in our students that actually the legacy and the importance stays. Thank you very much. Oh, many, as a matter of fact, uh, I had uh, a former uh, uh, as, uh, deputy advisor to Reagan, who was my student, uh, uh, and uh, uh, say, uh, three rectors of the University of Zagreb, uh, for instance. And, uh, so, yes, there are, there are a number of them, a lot of physicists. Uh, maybe some fellows of the World Academy. Questions or comments? Very good. It's very short comment. Very good. <laughs> and great feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you for doing this and then uh, explaining also some complex issue from the physics. Uh, I have very little, very small issue to raise. And uh, particularly, I agree that the knowledge is unadjustable, but at the same time we should admit this is renewable resource. Of course then it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's getting depreciated. The depreciation process is going on. And then, of course, this natural depreciation by you know, the progress in new theories, but also it might be the type of depreciation if you suppress the exchange, information, isolate, and so on. You know, but that, this is my comment from the very beginning of your uh, presentation. And uh, something else, but you know, it will come later. But uh, great presentation and puts uh, the uh, big picture uh, for, for us. Thank you. Thank you. Winston? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was waiting for you to miss some wonderful insights, but uh, <clears throat> what I find, uh, if you like, of uh, continuing concern is that we, uh, I, I thought your remarks were structured around a, a context and narrative uh, that is thought generating, knowledge generating, expanding. Uh, understanding of the world and ourselves of it. Uh, but now there are other domains and it seems to me that 
It still remains a fundamental disconnect between how one translates whatever insights we get from values, knowledge, and science into the work of political culture. What does this mean for that universe with its own norms and standards and so forth? And, uh, and at least in my experience, uh, politicians are very uneasy about this. They don't want to be confronted with the notion that the very thought process of making political decisions is you know, Or that we might have uh, more systematic and better ways of doing it. In other words, we are confronted with the dilemma of how we translate uh, the intellectual product into a policy process and then <coughs> break through the disconnect between the policy process and the operators in that process. So I just thought that might be. So. Yeah. Yes, Ian. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think I have the same comment. Mm. And I was thinking of the golden rule. The golden rule I'm more familiar with is the hero of the golden rules. Uh, in other words, the whole issue of the human dimension yeah. and how how in some sense we've got to get to first base. And first base is a platinum rule in a way of what are our values for the society and for, for planet Earth and those on it. And then everything else sort of falls, should fall into place. I think there's a link between the normative debate mm-hmm. and if you like the constructivist debate, the debate on how to, the how to is I think it's absolutely essential. Greater optimality is an interesting concept, but it depends on whose optimality you're parading, as it were. <laughs> and I, I think that it, this goes again back to this first question: how how do we know we've got how how do we know we've got the the game right and the rules right? That you are playing in the right game. Yeah. 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 How do we know that? And I think it's the same question once we start with. Once we have that, then a lot of the rest of the instrumentalities and means to that end. But we've confused ends with means, I think. I've talked a little bit about that in economics. Mm-hmm. And I feel the same here. We, you know, what is the golden rule for, for our survival? Um, uh, and I think that this was less or so knowledge and philosophical reflection and so forth needed some means of integrating itself into the the larger cultural dynamic of society. And he speculated about the creation of a subdiscipline called the policy sciences. We have really that notion that you can patch science on policy, and that suit is still a, a continuing debate for a lot of reasons, but I, I can see what he was getting at. Uh, <clears throat> and there is a society for the policy sciences. And in all came, all that they've done is they've drifted farther and farther away from the real world. They, they don't want to grapple with the, the real problems because it's not popular. You know? and they may come up with uh, recommendations that are, uh, uh, they would limit the access to grants. And so so, so uh, many of the central things that we look at are not necessarily the most popular things. You know, either from the point of the media, from the point of view of the elite, or, or, whatever, or, or, or what particular vested interests uh, uh, want to control that uh, way of thinking and doing uh, and translating the intellectual product of the culture, scientific product of the culture, into the real world of policy process. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to jump to what uh, Winston uh, finished. <coughs> uh, this is really a big challenge because our language you need to are trying to do this multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary is a very special language which does not communicate well with the political world. Mm-hmm. And what for us scientists natural, social, <clears throat> it's clear that there are certain areas of uncertainty. We don't know 100%, but I'm not sure. 
But politicians do not understand this, and they treat very often as a weakness. I mean, the debate on the climate change is a, is a good example. How I believe no good intention to translate very complex mm -hmm. uh, document into policy uh, made language caused troubles and it was explored by the authorities. Explored the authorities. I mean, maybe you know that some of our colleagues try to, to make easier or more appealing, you know, but you know, I mean, we say, but all mistakes or all these uncertain areas are often used or misused against the science-based policy. I think that how we can uh, counteract this? How we, we need to translate somehow science to the policy maker, but you know, how we can do this? But I think if we really hear what Ivo has said, and also what Alberto was saying from a different angle in his earlier presentations, our problem is not just a question of convincing the policy makers mm -hmm. of the right thing, because there are teeming numbers of, of theorists who are arguing in opposite directions mm -hmm. today, whether it's the monetarists or the neo-Keynesians or any other group. We, I think the whole premise of new paradigm and the importance of this is that we are not going to solve the problem at the level of current theory. The rationale for looking at it's of course we want to influence the policy maker and convince him, and of course that's a big problem. But are we clear that we're coming from a perspective that's going to be more effective than the existing perspectives that are being promoted? Uh, this topic of limits to rationality is really, I think, a, it's a very challenging and provocative one. If you listen to what Alberto said, he said two things. He said, I mean, the, the phrase itself is ambiguous, mm -hmm. because are we talking about the fact that we're not very rational, <laughs> or are we talking about the fact that rationality is limited in its capacity? Mm -hmm. Alberto was talking the first one, he, and he gave us very concrete evidence in the field of psychotherapy or the field of medicine uh, and in pharmacology and other areas uh, where we are not applying reason in our professions and in our professional practice in those that are highly respected. Now Evo is covering a whole other dimension of it. Are there inherent, let's not say that there are absolute limits, but are there characteristic ways in which we use rationality that itself is part of the problem? And if we're going to be formulating a new paradigm, shouldn't we be more aware of the fact, I mean, in science, when you use an instrument, you, you know the calibration, you know what it's good for, you know what it can't measure accurately, you don't, you know, you know the, the built-in error mechanisms of an instrument. Is there something we can learn from this? I think that the Evo's... Well, I think you have to take the secret account as well. There are people there who will look at whatever you've done with scientific rationality, realize that their interests are at stake, and they will challenge the rationality with some alternative model. That's what's happened in climate change. That's that was point. Uh, the, 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 the scientists were not prepared for the level of... Uh, I read some of the books that some of these idiots wrote, and it's, it's rubbish, but it, it, yeah, those are there as if it's a competing uh, system of rationality. So the question of science influence and influential is not a major contested domain. I, you don't mind, I, I give another example. I have two colleagues at the University of Florida who worked on, and I saw work on some extremely promising ways of generating cheap, clean energy. And the initial grant came from the US Navy. This was very promising. 
Then they came to me and asked me if I would help them set it up and approach somebody to donate and so on. When I read the project and I read just how promising it was, you know, do you know all those interest groups out there when you got through your head? Oh, no, they, they were just working with scientific rationality. Yes, the engineering part of it, yes, this, yes, that. And, and you know, we just did science. Well, uh, once it got out, the major uh, petroleum companies got the Navy to block uh, their grants. The entire Florida delegation couldn't get a cent on the entire US government. They were bought on every conceivable access to funding. And then GE offered them eight months they would just turn over all their research and, you know. Uh, and uh, fortunately, the government of Italy and the government of Israel decided this was something they could invest in. So they got completely cried out uh, with the knowledge that the major uh, uh, petroleum manufacturers are watching them like books, and any move they make is, they can't give a public paper for fear that, uh, that uh, there'll be some form of influence to have a I, I just mentioned that because, you know, yeah. that's the real world. But to say rationality is not unique, and it's, it has to be contextualized, and it has to be brought back to the debate on the values. Climate change is a good example. There is a rationale a rationality and a scientific rationality linked to climate change, but it's only rational if our values are long-term yes, yeah. and intertemporal. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not, it's totally irrational to be worried about climate change. And in fact, if you look at the human condition of the last 200 years or so, one could easily be drawn to the view that we don't give a damn about the long-term. All the institutions we have created in Humanity, from our political institutions to our financial markets to our economic decision making on discount rates, all would lead you, could lead you to a view that our values are on the whole short term, they're generational, but they're not intergenerational. And if that is the case, then shouldn't we get out of the business of climate change by being rather controversial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I do think we have to build, build this back into. It's rationality for what purposes, the values that we have to address. God, no. Um, just think of, you were the general was reminded to mention the presentation. I thought that I had another thing to do with the rationality. I want to take on the other aspect because the question that I have is, are we limiting our cap capability of understanding the world by this, through this framing that it has to be through the tools of rationality? You know, is there a world beyond rationality where you would need a totally different type of, of a toolkit which you are not capable of even finding because you are so addicted to these uh, tools of rationality? That's, that's the question that I have. So one, and the second one is I think that um, when you talk about religion, for example, I think it's, it's really well for you to see that religion is just one part of it. You know, I mean, religion is institutionalized. Um, but, but on the other side, you, you have sort of a lot of people who are not any more part of a religion, but they are highly spiritual and they think beyond the material world. So the one is the institutionalized spirituality and the other one is the spirituality. About a year ago, Ivo and I wrote an article on uh, analyzing. Ivo mentioned here that uh, some of the greatest science, the great scientific discoveries were those that synthesize what appear to be unrelated phenomenon or contradictory phenomenon, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Newton's motion and inertia or Maxwell taking electricity and magnetism, which we mm -hmm. thought were independent phenomena. And in that article, we tried to analyze some of the successful mm -hmm. use of mental capacities that seems to be uncommon. That, that, that what we call a genius or somebody who comes up with a great discovery, it's not that he's using a faculty of which we're incapable, but he's not insisting on use of the faculty the way we normally do. In Alberto's presentations, he was constantly coming back, and it came out in many of the presentations about our reductionist view. We want to divide reality infinitely and take it a piece at a time. 
and the whole rationale for systems theory or ecology uh, or a new paradigm is to say all these aspects of why we're here this week is because all these aspects of reality are interdependent. But we know there's a tendency of mind, all our minds, we concentrate on something. And the moment we use the power of concentration, we tend to look at part and make that part the whole and separate it from the rest of reality. And so there are other characteristics like that of our normal mentality. If we're conscious of those, if we're going to formulate a new paradigm or if we're going to formulate I mean, there's a reason why we don't have a transdisciplinary science of society. It's not easy for the mind to work in that way. It's easy to concentrate. So I think one of our goals should be to try to, in the academy, is to try to be clear about the typical types, ways, characteristics of how the mind works and how we can counter that by conscious effort, whether it's through a rational process or an ins a process of insight or whatever. Yeah, just one minute. I think one of the things we get locked into is our thinking, I'm thinking of what Carl said, our thinking that the opposite of rationality is irrationality. Mm -hmm. But it is not. Exactly. The opposite of rationality is emotionality, in such a way. It is, the, the rationale starts here, and the emotion starts here. And we've been very bad at thinking that the opposite of rationale is irrational. It's not. Uh, and we have to understand the psychology of the human mind, mm -hmm. psychology of the state, the psychology of the world, of humanity, in a fundamentally different way. And I think if we have a new theory, it has to start from there, mm -hmm. and not, ah, oh, we have to have the opposite of rationality. Mm -hmm. We actually need to develop a theory of emotionality. Okay. okay. So, words. Yes, for instance. It's possible that we sometimes can actually turn rationality into logical paradigm, or the causal yeah. logical paradigm, but that does not account for the brain, uh, and many psychotherapists have noted that there are twin ways in the mind. You know? There is that aspect of it, but there's also the, the aspect of free fantasy, and, and the aspect of the cultivated uh, imagination, uh, and the twin ways in the mind are what may constitute the, the more inclusive new paradigm yeah. rationality. And to give this one illustration, I know that when my mentor used to work with his new PhD students, what are you doing? The guy has got some narrow, you know. And so I once saw him just get the guy to relax and free associate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all the disconnected things is now seen in a different way. Comes back the next day, he has a really interesting idea, you know? And uh, I was told by uh, that, that the Lazarus himself he used the method of free fantasy on that Google and Reasonment and he used it on me in a couple of meetings when I was putting my dissertation together. So, so I think there is that uh, aspect of it which shouldn't be discounted as having nothing to do with nationality. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, he described this in the initiation of what and how you can look at something as having to involve uh, a creative orientation. You know, I'm just yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, Sasha, and then we will conclude this so that we have time for. Can we, can we say that our, our uh, manners, uh, tools, and our things are hidden in our, in our brain, but our motifs are hidden in our hearts? As, as a counterbalance of the rational emotion. I thought it may be you because we are all. Uh, 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 Usually mixing uh, irrational and uh, instead of emotional. That's a very, very big mistake, and usually uh, yeah. facing, facing with. In one more detail concerning, uh, concerning uh, uh, politicians. Uh, I don't think that, that, are, that, that politicians are, are scientific mind, in a sense. After reading Matteo Renzi's book about uh, Florence and his experience as ex, uh, ex mayor of uh, Florence, he was shocked how it was uh, terribly uh, hard to implement uh, something which is very uh, good for, for that city, for that uh, community, to protect cultural heritage, to improve the city, city functioning, and so on. He was shocked because of the parliament clash of values and different perceptions and obstacles and everything. So there is a kind of implementational step which is very important. 
As a scientist, we, we, we are uh, fully devoted to the rationale side of our mind, how to say, our, our, our uh, mind. And then uh, we are usually blaming politicians for not being so aware. I'm not sure that this is fully true. There is implementation, implementation of problem, set of problems they, they are facing with and coping with. So think about yourself, if you are a politician, what would you do? And that's it. Okay, thank you very much. I think this was a, a very good discussion. As a matter of fact, uh, I would like to define a, a reasonably good lecture as the lecture where the discussion is better than the lecture. Uh, <laughs> because this, uh, this means actually quite a lot. It means that it opened a number of things. But let me nevertheless, I did not reply, of course, to your comments as they were coming, because I thought this is much richer when you speak rather than me trying to interfere all the time. But let me make few observations on a quite personal note. Observation number one is, I heard several of you saying, Evo was saying that and so on. And then I was surprised, did I really say that? Uh, so sometimes you really don't know what you said, uh, even five minutes ago, because it gets a different view uh, coming uh, from, uh, from uh, 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 being heard from a uh, other person and would be being in a different context, in a different light and so on. A lot of the discussion was dealing with uh, the politicians and scientists. Okay, let me surprise you and say that I do consider myself uh, actually a combination of a physicist uh, who was quite for a long time devoted to political activity. Not, uh, Of course, there is no doubt that being a president of the World Academy is to a large extent a political uh, activity. There is no doubt about that. But actually it started much, much earlier when uh, I was the director of the Institute, actually an acting director of the Institute, and then when suddenly I got a call, this was precisely in uh, 74, I got a call from uh, uh, the Ministry of Defense of Yugoslavia calling me immediately to come to Belgrade and somehow I had a feeling, which turned out to be correct, uh, that this was in connection with uh, a renewed attempt to build a nuclear bomb in, uh, in uh, former Yugoslavia. Now this part of course dealt with the question that uh, at that time Yugoslavia, as you know, was the leader of a non-aligned movement. It went into very drumming this peace, 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 collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And then India dropped a bomb and then Yugoslavia was trying to do this. Okay, so, to, I mean, this is written in an article that I uh, published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, but then essentially I uh, came there. And of course, after about an hour discussion and so on, uh, a man from the Secret Service came and said, you all have to sign that you are privy to the uh, governmental secret and that uh, you should not tell this to anyone and all the blah blah, otherwise you go to prison. These things. So uh, when I signed that uh, together with the others, I said, look, I mean, I'm rather in the awkward position. I have a air ticket for the United States. Uh, I'm actually supposed to go there to work at the first at the national uh, uh, at, at the Naval Research Laboratory, and after that to go to Los Alamos, which, as you know, is a weapon laboratory. You, I, of course, should I cancel this and so on? And then he said immediately, no, no, you go there. Uh, to make things worse, when I was uh, several months earlier in Los Alamos, this was a time when a major facility was done, and there was a story with all of these scientists, uh, you know, they meet together, at, uh, I mean, these people don't have clearance and so on, so they meet with those people who don't have clearance, the secrets are being uh, leaking and so on, we should not have that. Now, I'm going there, so I was thinking, well, what the hell is all of this, you know? So these are the examples of really political story of which you really don't quite understand, uh, you, and you become immersed in something which is, at the same time, bad and good, and so we are all players of uh, various political games. One of the essential characteristics, and I think the book that you gave me from Laswell, Laswell actually goes and uses the definition of politics, which I think he himself says follows directly the words of Lenin, you know, the brutality of this, of this politics. Uh, but speaking about communication, 
There is a great man, a great physicist, who opposed to Einstein was a man with thousands of students. This was Niels Bohr. And he communicated with them beautifully. Then he comes to Churchill. I think I told to some of you the story. And Churchill speaks to him. And Churchill is infuriated and said, this man is so confused that, that we have to put him in prison because he will do all the, all the damage. So the question is, when you speak a political uh, language, is it different from the scientific language? And obviously, Niels Bohr did not know how to do this. Einstein, on the other hand, apparently, had, Einstein had zero students in his life. You know, you can, he collaborated with Infeld, who was his peer. Uh, so the, these are these are strange things. How you do this? And of course, the utmost importance is a question of values that uh, Ian put now, but he repeated now what he said several other times previously, the importance of the value. Value is something that we have really to think very carefully and think in terms of what are they, what are the essential values, and what are, for instance, you know, I read, all of you read this, apparently a value in uh, part of the West Africa is the link between a deceased person and those of us who remain alive. And the essence is to do this, to touch the deceased person. And that is the spreading of Ebola. Now, is there anything there that is so deep that it should be? The, the contact, yes, but the contact should not be physical. Okay? They stick on a physical contact. So we have to somehow clean, prune, get what is the essence. What is the essence of the things that we should do for, I think, one of the basic values is, uh, and there, of course, I'm extremely human selfish, is the idea of uh, survival. Survival of having offsprings. Since you cannot have too many offsprings, the only thing you do is you become a teacher. Then you have many, many offsprings. Thank you. Okay, we have... Uh,